Good morning. You know, I've given my testimony at churches before, but this is the first time ever I am giving my testimony on Easter. So this is something I've always wanted to do. I like to do it now. If I say, he is risen, I'd like you to say, he is risen indeed. Ready? He is risen. risen Thank you. Amen. You know, it was, in fact, Easter in 1975, when I was eight years old, that I had a glimpse of Jesus. You see, I had been born into a Buddhist family, didn't have any idea who God was, who Jesus was, until then. It was interesting because I had this glimpse of who would become my savior later through the means of colored eggs. You know what I'm talking about, right? In 1975, I was hospitalized at Mary Knoll Hospital in Busan. This was for what would be my last eye surgery. I was born with glaucoma in both eyes. I lost most vision in my, le- on my, le- in my left eye uh, before I was one year old. And I had seen some through my right eye, which still had the glaucoma, but it was being controlled. When I was seven years old, however, the retina in that eye detached, and there was only one doctor who could operate and uh, he was in Busan at Mary Knoll Hospital. As you, some of you may know, um, that hospital is a Catholic hospital. And on Easter Sunday in 1975, I was invited to the chapel. I had, um, I think they told me stories about Jesus, how he came back from life. I was only eight years old. I, didn't, I was just focused on the colored eggs. Well... That was the first glimpse. I lost everything in terms of eyesight by the time I was nine in 1976, fall of 1976. I went to school for the blind in Seoul. And there, through missionaries and pastors who would come once a week um, to hold a Christian service, I first heard about God about Jesus, what he did for all of us. Well, you know, as I said, I, came, I come from a non-religious family who claim to be Buddhists. One of the things I heard about what Jesus said that really became a big inspiration was this. In John chapter 9, his disciples asked him, Teacher, this man who was born blind, was it his sin or his parents' sin that led this man to be born blind? Jesus' reply that pleased me a good deal was that neither he nor his parents sinned. His condition is so that his God's work will be displayed in his life. I like that explanation really a lot because all my young life, I had heard the same question. What did he do in his previous life so bad that he was born blind? What did his parents do? It was, it's remarkable that same question that had been asked so long ago, or was still being asked. Well, that was the first impression about Jesus. Well, there comes a time, there came a time when I had to take faith seriously. When I was 14 years old, I, had, I received an invitation to go to the United States to study on my own. No relatives in the U.S. to watch over me. Didn't know a word of English, but there was this remarkable opportunity. And I really wanted to do it, but I was afraid. You can imagine, 14-year-old boy, 
cannot see, and no language skills, nobody he knew going alone to America. Genesis 12, we read, the Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. That became a guidepost. That became a reason I could, in fact, go alone to this faraway place where I knew no one. God blessed me as he blessed Abraham. Number of stories here. I'll try to make it fast. When I was 10th grade, I realized that I wanted to stay in the US, not just as Yuak Seng and go back someday to Korea. I wanted to live in America. So I tried to find a way to get a green card. Think about that. It's just stupid in a way. A 16 year old boy trying to do something like that. Well, I looked up the law, found out that if um, a senator or a congressman were to sponsor me, they could slip in a little bill, little amendment to any bill saying the United States of America will give this person a green card. As you can imagine, every congressional representative and senator I approached said no. I was upset, upset about that, really, but who knew that would actually lead to extraordinary educational opportunities. Because I did not have a green card, my choices of college that I, where I could apply, I found, found out was very limited. Um, every place I was looking at said, can you pay? Does your family have enough money? And even back then, private college education cost $80,000 for four years. And we could not prove to anyone, my family I mean, had that kind of means. So I asked my guidance counselor, what schools do not have that kind of requirements? And he said, well, places like Harvard, Princeton, MIT, UPenn, IVs, most of them do not care how much your family has. And I said, well, how many kids have gone to schools like that from our high school? He said, none, never. And I said, that's not a good answer. And he said, well, doesn't mean you can't. Doesn't mean you can't. So I applied and I got into quite a number of those schools. And as Pastor Justin said, I wound up at Harvard for undergrad and MIT for grad school. What a blessing. Can't imagine that kind of thing today. Another time when God intervened. I wanted to become a doctor in, uh, at Harvard. You know, most Korean American kids were either pre-med or pre-law. I didn't fancy myself as a lawyer, so I said, well, I want to become a doctor. Sounded cool, you know, a blind person becoming a doctor. And so I pursued pre-med courses for two and a half years and found out that there are certain restrictions that almost prohibited a person with, who cannot see to go uh, before going to medical school. And I was very discouraged by that. I mean, pre-med Harvard is actually very, very tough, very competitive and it's cutthroat almost. And I thought I got through all that, but God said no, apparently. He put up a barrier. Well. Cut, long story short, I, through that barrier, I found my, I don't know if I would call it vocation. I, let's say I found my career. I wound up on Wall Street as an analyst evaluating companies for investment. And I think really, if I know anything, I can tell you confidently that I like this job a lot better than, uh, um, healing patients and so on. I don't think I'm good enough for that. So God, again, blocked my way and directed me to the better place. 
At J.P. Morgan, as uh, the pastor said, that was my first employer, 1994, first blind person to be hired as an analyst ever in their history. 1998, I got fired. This was a big mass layoff, and I was part of it. I had gotten married in 1996. I had this young bride, two years into the marriage, more like an adventure, more like a gambling, really. And uh, I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to tell her? Again, God knew what he was doing. He led me. J.P. Morgan at the time was at 60 Wall Street. He led me to Brown Brothers Hedeman and Company at 59 Wall Street, right across the street, for a better job. From 1998, I'm still with the same firm. And the last story of God coming aside, coming alongside and making life feel right again was our childlessness. We really wanted children. Uh, we got married in 1996, as I said. Before our wedding, we were talking about having like maybe four kids would be ideal. Two and two, you know, it's a balanced thing. And God did not bless us with children. We went through a lot of fertility treatment, all the things that we could do, and God still did not give us any children. Well, you know, when we submit to God's apparent will, God does, in fact, act sometimes. So we gave up this idea of having children from our own bodies, began to fill out adoption papers. In 2004, while Grace was going through mountain and mountain of paper, we found out that she was pregnant. No IVF, nothing else. It was just a miracle. We had our first child in 2005. David Patrick, He's uh, almost 17 now. In 2014, he gave us a second child through the means of Jan adoption. I'll talk about that later. And so we wound up with two children, two beautiful children. And I thought life could not get any better. Genesis 13, we read, Abram became very wealthy in livestock in silver and gold. I don't know about livestock, silver and gold, but I thought that things just could not be any better. But there's something that was still lacking. When I turned 40, I realized that I had been receiving grace all my life. I didn't do anything for anyone else. And I knew that Christian life could not be lived like that. I began to look out, outward, and the idea of grace dispensing came to mind. This was a dream. I thought I could do something. I should do something. As a recipient of so much grace, I thought I should dispense at least some. In Genesis 15, we read, he took, God took Abram outside. He told him to look up at the heavens, count the stars if you can count them. He was talking about the children he's going to give Abram. And, you know, it was that kind of a promise. On the day I turned 40, I prayed. I said, Lord, you gave me so much. I want to do something to make God's kingdom here on earth a reality for somebody, even for one person. And God promised he would, in fact, do that. And... I was hoping, I was desperately hoping that I would meet people who would work with me to do this. And this is where we come to Yana. You are not alone ministry. I learned that there were like 20,000 children living in children's homes in Korea, mostly abandoned by their parents. And they face some stark reality, especially when they have to leave the homes at age 18. And I wanted to really do something for them and you can read all about what happened afterwards in my book. I'm sorry, we don't have the time for it. 
And in, again, Genesis 15, we read, Abram believed the Lord, and he credited to him as righteousness. As righteousness. I think faith is about remembering. Challenges and disappointments always come. And when they do, we get so wrapped up in that specific current situation that we forget what God has done for us in the past. And whenever disappointments come, I try to remember these and other things that God has done for me in the past that turned despair into happiness, hopelessness into bright light of awesome future. I want to share something with you this morning. This is the last thing. I came to Korea this time for a number of reasons. One of them was to appear in a very popular, very influential TV show. I was really hoping for this because uh, last July, I was supposed to appear in the same show. And apparently, something really unexpected happened. Just as we were going into pre-production, the staff got COVID. So they had to shut down, they had to suspend production. So I, had, I couldn't wait around, but I had to go home to the States. So this time around, I was so hoping that it will work out. For reasons I cannot disclose here, pre-production was supposed to start two days ago on Friday, and just as uh, that hour approached, I got word that the production team was not working anymore. And again, my hope for this TV show appearance was dashed. I'd like to read a short passage that I wrote on Saturday. This is what I call this Unholy Saturday. I'd like to read this for you. An overwhelming disappointment came. By instinct, I thought first of the necessity of calming the disappointment of the people who anticipated with me and cheered me on. With a positive attitude and hopeful words, I comforted and encouraged them. While I was doing that, I could not feel the crushing injury of my own heart. Now that everyone is asleep, how come the tears flow and the heart feel so empty? Then, with the pain that starts in the chest and rises all the way to the brain, an image comes of him without sin or blemish, of him who suffered the cruelest penalty, too brutal even for the worst criminals, of the Lord who for a while had to endure the darkness of the tomb and the silence of the Father. Compared to the injustices he suffered, my heartaches are nothing. The day of the empty tomb is coming. The day of miracles is coming when all disappointments will be blown into the wind like dust. The day of his return is imminent. He who heals the hurt of mankind, but also, also salves my disappointments, small and great. In Revelations 22, 20, we read, yes, I'm coming soon, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the, the day of the empty tomb has come. Our response is to live as he taught us to live, loving God and loving each other. Thank you.